Who can say no to playing with new paint? I went and got myself a set of Liquitex heavy body acrylics. Now these aren't made for miniatures, but there's nothing in the rule book that says I can't use them on them either. And so in this video, I'm going to explain the differences between artist acrylics like these and miniature lines, as well as paint a miniature with them so we can compare and review. So what is the difference between artist paints and miniatures paints? The truth is not much. The pigments are all the same pigments. The only major difference there is that miniature paint lines don't use toxic pigments like cadmiums and cobalts because they know we're a bunch of paint licking, airbrush using crazies. Whereas artist paints mostly assume the only interaction they'll get between out of the tube and on the canvas is being touched by a brush. That said, Liquitex do have cadmium free versions of cadmium paints which are basically mixes of other pigments to attempt to replicate the hue and opacity of those cadmiums. So as long as we're following the labels and warnings, we shouldn't have a problem accidentally using toxic paint on our miniatures. Speaking of labels though, that's another huge point where artist paints and model paints differ. Miniature paints generally just give you a silly name close to what your color is in the model. And that's it, no other information. Whereas artist colors not only give you an industry standard name usually, but also other important bits of information. First of those is a pigment code. When you look at reds across miniature paint lines, while many of them might look similar, you can't really be sure which red or reds are in it. And there's a good 25 to 50 red pigments to choose from. Artist paints always put the pigment codes on the tubes or bottles, making sure you know exactly which ones were used. Most will only have a single pigment but mixes will have every pigment used. So you can know from a label like this that this blue is made up of a blue pigment, a green pigment, a white pigment, and another blue pigment. I don't know why miniature paint lines don't like to divulge that information. Other than scale color artists and chimera color, we pretty much have no idea what pigments make up the bulk of our paints. But also make getting consistent mixes across paint lines impossible to predict because they don't all act the same when mixed into other colors. The second bit of information they give you is opacity. I'm sure we've all been there. You pick up a nice snake bite leather because it looks like the right kind of leather for the belt you're working on and you paint it over a black base coat only to find out it barely covered it. Well this paint company sucks so let me try another one and you get the same kind of result. They suck too. But then you get one that actually covers really well. Obviously, since we can't see what pigments are in it, we don't know what's making it more opaque. But the problem is, is we had to test it ourselves in order to figure out the opacity. Artist paints tell you right on the tube how that paint is going to cover. This square has three levels of opacity. A white square means that it's a transparent pigment. A half and half box means it's semi-opaque. And a full black square means it's opaque. So I know before I even put any of the paint on my palette, how I'm going to have to treat the underlayers to get the result I want. Lastly, they also tell us about light fastness. Now, we don't really have to worry about this too much as we don't expect our miniatures to end up in a gallery 200 years from now. But what it's telling you is how long the pigments will last before fading. And since most of these are based on hundreds of years, other than fluorescence, it's not something we have to worry about. That's enough chin wagging from me, so it's time to paint something. I feel like painting this feline warrior from Artisan's Guild for this one, and I'm going to start with his fur. I don't have an orange in this set, so I'm going to have to mix one. But know both the yellow and red are semi-opaque, which means I'll need to do something to this black undercoat first before I try base coating with those. The ivory black, though not the strongest tinting strength, which you can find out more about on my video about black pigments, is still opaque. And since I want a dark first layer, mixing this into the orange mix should give me a more opaque brown to start from. So I get that base coat down first, thinning down my paint just enough so that it flows well. My first impression from this is that this might still not be opaque enough, so it would require a few layers for sure. The paint itself does go on nice and smooth though, and even on this extremely hot day that I'm painting on, stays wet for a decent amount of time. For base layer number two, I'm going to switch it up a bit. Because it wasn't beside the other yellow in the box, I forgot this set comes with a yellow ochre, which is an opaque yellow. 
so mixing this with the red and black should give me a better base layer to work from. While I paint the second layer, I can explain a bit about why I prefer heavy body paints to fluid paints. The answer is for two reasons. One is that I've just been painting for so long that if I shake any more bottles, my arm's likely to fall off, and either I could get a vortex mixer, or I just buy paint that doesn't need shaking. Second reason is that heavy body tends to take a little bit longer to dry. Not much, but enough that I can get precious few seconds on a brush load before it starts to dry while I'm trying to work. Here's the second slash fixer upper base coat finished, and I'd say it did a much better job. So just another light layer to fill the gaps off camera, and we're good to continue. To start layering, I make another mix of the yellow ochre and red, but also add a bit of the base I was using just so it doesn't make too stark of a step up. With this, I pick out all the muscles, leaving only the deep valleys untouched, but also lifting my brush in the middle of the muscles so that that is where the paint settles out from. These paints are all satin and finish, so this will have a bit of a shine to it, but satin paints usually are a little easier to blend with, at least when it comes to layering like this, which is why I think most game color lines are satin as well. The finish tends to allow the paints to spread slightly, while matte paints are very good at sticking exactly where you put them, so even though these are artist paints, I'd say they're actually pretty beginner friendly in that regard too. For the next highlight, I just do the base mix of yellow and red. It looks really bright on the palette, but if I'm right, it should dry a bit less intense. And since I want to use this to pick out the fur, I hope my theory is correct. Using a bit smaller brush, I layer this along the upper parts of the muscles, following the strands of fur I can see. When it comes to fur and muscles, usually it's sculpted as one or the other, and I find myself having to draw the fur on myself. But that's why I really actually like this sculpt, because it combines both in a really nice way. Like I anticipated, the bright orange actually dried a little more mute. One of the hardest things I think to get used to when painting is color shift, where paint will dry a little bit of a different color than what it was when wet. And these paints are unfortunately not immune from it, but very few are. So I'll do one last highlight, adding just a bit more of the white into my last mix. This white is the same pigment as most of the whites you find in any miniatures paint line. So other than the satin agent, I'm not expecting anything radical here. Using this mix to just pick out the fur lines in the middle of the muscles towards my light source, trying hard not to go overboard with them like I tend to defaultly do. Another paint I got in this set is a transparent burnt umber. It's made from the yellow ochre pigment, a red oxide pigment, which I have on its own as well, and Mars Black. On the palette, it looks quite thick and opaque, but as I pull it out and water it down, you can see its translucency. The idea though is to use this as the first shadow, so translucency is fine. I was even going to wet blend it, which is why I added water first, but as I started to paint, it's like I didn't even put any on my brush. So I tried it without any water, and I could see it going on, but it was so see-through that it wasn't really making huge changes. So what I think this actually is, is like a thick wash almost. It's got the creamy consistency of a heavy body paint, but the properties of a wash, which, hey, I didn't even know that was possible and is kind of cool, though I'd still have preferred just a normal paint that I could turn into a wash myself. I want his pants to be red, and so starting from black is going to be a bit of a problem, since reds are mostly semi-transparent. However, I did get this red oxide on the side of the set, which is opaque and would make a good base for the red, so I'm going to start a base coat with that. One thing about artist colors that is different to miniature paints is in the store itself. When you buy separate colors from a miniatures paint line, they're all the same price. Artist colors though charge you based on how much the pigment costs. So red oxide like this one is on the cheap side of things because it's made out of rust, while quinacridone red is more expensive as it's a more expensive pigment. After the base coat, I thought it'd be interesting to see how they work with an airbrush, so I add some white and red to my airbrush to do a zenithal on the pants, just spraying lightly from his knees and up. His pants folds are quite deep and overlapping, so I feel this is just much easier to do than by brush. However, due to the proximity of the pants to the fur on his waist, I do use a brush for that. I'm actually quite impressed how well the Liquitex flows through the airbrush even when I have a lot of the pigment in it. Normally, I thin my paints quite a lot, and I feel like the same amount of a matte paint would have had a bit harder time while getting the same kind of coverage. To get the red, 
it's my usual recipe of thinning down the pure naphthal red, then using it as a glaze over the pants, trying to get it as even as possible without it pooling into the folds. The one thing I didn't expect from the red oxide base was that it would be as bright of an orange as it is. I've used the red oxide from Chimera Color, which is darker and more red. So as I do this step, I realize that the folds of the cloth aren't dark enough to give me the red transition I was after. So on introspection, I should have added black to the red oxide. To fix that little mistake, I want to see how the transparent brown mixes with the other colors, and adding it to the red seemed to give me a dark red shade. But how would it apply to the model was the question. In this case, I at least see the shadows going into the folds and drawing a bit darker, but nowhere near as deep dark as it looked on the palette. So with this, I think it might just take a few washes in the crevices to get to a point I'm happy with. But that just means nice transitions due to the layers of shading. The last thing I want to try is a little non-metal metal, starting with a brown base coat for a gold. The only problem is, the brown I have is really transparent, so not much good for a base coat. But that just means I can test the primaries to see what kind of brown they give me, taking the most opaque blue for some opacity, along with the yellow ochre for the same reason, and then the naphthal red. I start with a red and yellow base, since I want this to be a more warmish brown to go with the orange and red theme I already have going on on the model. The thing with the heavy bodies is to thin them down, you really have to mix them well so that all the gel is broken up and thinned down. It's kind of the trade-off for not having to shake them, I guess. It's a bit too bright as the base layer, so I add a bit of the black to give me something to start with. As I base coat, I let some of the black hang around in the deep recesses so I can keep a bit of the darkest contrast. For the next layer, it's just the original mix I had made without the black included. This will be my guide layer, so I pick out all the edges and any points I think should get reflections. This is probably the most crucial step of non-metal metal, but also the hardest sometimes because it's up to me to decide how the light will fall on this metal. I could use a reference to help, but since most of it is just bracelets, I should be alright. This isn't looking all that gold at the moment, so I think it's time to bring in some yellow. Well, more yellow. Adding Azo yellow to the palette and mixing it with the yellow oxide for some opacity, and just a bit of the brown mix for continuity. With this, I pretty much retrace my steps from the last layer, following the guides I had made for where my highlight points would be. I found I could put this on quite heavy and it still dried semi-opaque, allowing each layer to blend as I move up in transitions. For the next layer, I go straight in with the Azo Yellow, picking out all of the highlight points along the edges mostly. Though on the bracelets, since there are some round curves, I pick out some of the rounded highlights as well. Along some of the edging, I also make little dots at points where I think the light would be brightest. This will be the spots for my brightest highlights to go after this layer. Then finally, I mix some white into the Yazo yellow and use this for the extreme highlight points, adding dots at first to where it would be brightest and then extending that out if I think it's needed along the edges, like on the crescent of the moon and along the sharp edges of the bangles he wears all over. Since the rest of the model is just going to be small details, I'll paint that off camera for the final spin and summary. So what do I like about the Liquitex heavy bodies? For me, the number one factor is their longer working time. They tend to stay wet on my brush longer, which for me is key for my dry climate. Single pigments mean the most saturated colors and allow you to play more with mixing yourself. Some pigments are a little too transparent, though that's only the colors that came in this set. They do have normal browns that you can get off the shelf that would be more appropriate for minis painting. I also find them very easy to blend with, especially wet blending and layering. For what I don't like, the first thing for me is the color shift. It's very noticeable in some of the colors, appearing much brighter when dry or much darker than I had anticipated. And second, which is more of a personal thing, is I'm not a huge fan of satin. And while I could varnish in matte, I find that it's always a better matte finish by painting in matte in the first place. That said, there is a reason most satin paints are marketed as game color lines. Vallejo Game Color and Scale 75's Fantasy and Games lines, the most prominent in my mind, because satin is durable, which means if you're painting to play, these paints will give you a strong finish that should last a long time on the tabletop. The last thing to mention is the price. So a 17 milliliter bottle of Vallejo goes for about $4 Canadian. 
A tube, which is 59 milliliters from Liquitex, can be between $13 and $30, depending on the pigment inside. I was able to get this set and these two tubes on sale for about 30% off. That kind of volume you might never use in an entire lifetime of painting miniatures, so it is good value. And if you live somewhere remote where you might not have a game store that has traditional miniature paint lines, but these are available, they will work. Before buying, figure out what colors you need for the models that you're painting. While I do think a set like this is a good starting point, you might be better off figuring out exactly what colors you'll need and use so that you can end up with a more useful collection to you in the long run. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.